This is a heavy one. Our classic episode today involves crime, involves kidnapping, it involves organs. It's something called the red market. And heads up, it may not be appropriate for all listeners. Uh, the organ trade, it's a real thing. It's a real problem. We're going to get into the issues with uh, the stuff that's above board in every country across the world where there's a need for a transplant. Uh, there is a need for a donor, someone to give their kidney or their liver or their you know, parts of their eyes, their corneas or something because someone else is in need. Usually it goes in the order of someone passes or donates a part of themselves and then it can go to an eligible person. But in this case, what we're talking about, it's when there are a lot of people who need something and there's no supply. Yeah, it's, it's a real ongoing problem until organs can be uh, reliably manufactured in a lab. Uh, but on a lighter note, just a bit of stuff that I want you to know behind the scenes, peek past the curtain, folks. Uh, Matt, I want to publicly thank you for talking me off the editorial ledge years back when we did this, because I really wanted to call this episode The Organ Trail, and that would be an inappropriate joke. I mean, you know, you got to follow something to get to the bad guys. And in this case, they left a trail of bloody organs and fractured lives. I'm sorry. This liver is no longer viable due to dysentery. Game over. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I held on to that for years so I could just say it now. But but no, this is a uh, crime kidnapping your organs. The red Certainly market. you said it on the episode as well. You wouldn't have you wouldn't have kept that one in your back pocket this long, Ben. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's we'll see, game. right? We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Let us know. Did he say it in the episode? Do you choose to cross the river with your wagon? Uh, it's a big choice. It's a big choice. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben, and you are you, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Today's podcast comes, oddly enough, from a uh, a pretty tasteless joke that we made a while back, and I don't remember if it made it to the air. Did it? It did, yeah. We were joking about the Oregon Trail, because someone suggested we, we cover the topic of illegal organ trafficking. Which is a great suggestion. Yeah. And then we all died of dysentery. <laughs> and then we all died of dysentery in the middle of a <laughs> spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we were dumb enough to start the game as farmers. Oh, damn, never do that. Way harder. Uh, but yeah, we were kicking around uh, just terrible titles. Uh, and one of those was, of course, The Oregon Trail. The organ. Trail. Yeah, well, if you say it like that, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it can go either way. <laughs> well, title aside, uh, this is... Don't apologize for that title, Ben. I didn't. I just said title aside. That's fair. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we think this is a complex, global, and continual phenomenon, and it is worth exploring in depth because aside from some maybe scare pieces that pop up at a slow day in the news cycle, this is not really examined, and uh, the causes of it aren't examined as well. There is a lot of stuff they don't want you to know about organ transplants, the organ trade in general, what has been called the red market. So I, I, at first I wanted to ask you guys, uh, Matt, Noel, those are our real names. Sorry mm. for everyone. Uh, should we apologize for that one? I don't know what you're talking about. That's a good point. So have, have you guys ever known or been acquainted with someone who received an organ transplant? I could not come up with a good example when I was going back through my life. Uh, if you count bone marrow, which I think you should, yeah, um, yeah, then yes, I know it's an intense process as far as like getting on a list, getting matched with the right candidate, mm -hmm. and then actually getting the procedure done and having everything booked because it is a very timely process. You know, once everything goes through, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty, and you even hear stories about people trying to get 
higher up on the list by, you know, greasing some palms here and there, you know? Right. So, I mean, there's a lot at stake, obviously. And, um, I won't say who this person was just to, you know, maintain their, their privacy, but yeah, it was, it was very nerve, nerve wracking, just wondering when it was going to happen, when it was going to go through and when it did go through, if everything was going to work out correctly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because even with everything going as well as possible, there's still, a, uh, there's still a significant risk. Sure. And it's not like if that one doesn't work out, they're just going to give you another one. I mean, that's the one that you get. And then yeah. you, if it doesn't work out, if you make it, you have to start the whole process over again. So that is a terrifying prospect. Uh, let's, let's talk about organs first. Cause as you know, this podcast is part of how stuff works. So we want to start at the most basic thing. Organs. They're one of the few things that everybody has in common. Everyone who is involved with this show, we all have organs. Yes, everyone listening to this show hopefully has organs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some sort of machine consciousness listening there, and that gets into a conversation about what would constitute an an organ. Yeah, maybe Dick Cheney is listening with his robotic heart that just constantly circulates blood instead of pumping. That's a pacemaker. That's not, isn't it? I thought it was a pacemaker. It's not. He doesn't have a pacemaker anymore. Now it's just a constant flow of blood. There's no, he has no heartbeat. Oh, I thought you just meant he was like a heartless individual. I thought you were. Well, being sure. That's, a, that's implied. I thought you were riffing. Yeah. No, no, I'm not riffing. This is true, but, uh, but I'm also implying certain, certain ways. There are levels to yeah. this statement. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I want one of those. I find stuff. Dick Cheney charming personally. <laughs> that's true. You usually say that. As soon as because I'm smiling, I'm doing a just, just, just uh, for the for the folks listening. I am doing a big Cheshire Cat grin here. I know sometimes I say things like I mean them, and then I'm smiling or making a face at these guys, and you guys don't see that. So you may think I have a quite a odd variety of opinions out there in podcast land. But just to yeah. set the record straight, you know, Dick Cheney's a prince. Mm-hmm. Go on. Noel Brown is a huge Dick Cheney fan. Uh, uh, so by the strictest definition in, bi- in biology, biologically speaking, outside of the world of music, an organ is just a group of tissues in a living organism that have been adapted to perform a specific function. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds pretty simple. You have a heart, and your heart has, like, one main job, right? Sure, same with your liver, your kidneys, mm-hmm. your eyes, uh, all of the parts. I think there are 78 Official organs? Well, by that, by, it depends again on the definition and be around 78. Mm -hmm. People will argue back and forth what does or does not constitute an organ entire. What I find neat though is that these organs are divided into two very distinct categories. Um, all the ones we mentioned are considered vital organs, which are organs that are absolutely essential for maintaining your health and, you know, mm-hmm. your life, ultimately. Um, these are the kinds of things like your heart, your brain, your kidneys, your liver, things that perform processes that you need done in order to live mm-hmm. in the environment that we are. Yeah, but I think the uh, besides the eyes, I mentioned the eyes. That's true. But I don't know. Would you consider eyes part of this second category? Vestigial organs, which no is no way. Yeah, I wouldn't think so either. <laughs> well, I'm. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think you would probably get arguments for that. I suppose you could say maybe we we could live in a society where we have evolved beyond the need of our eyes, but it'd certainly put you at a disadvantage. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And right now, society has evolved to make something like blindness or deafness uh, not a death sentence. Mm-hmm. But if people were simply animals in the wild, yeah, hunter gatherer type scenario, like you right. would be sunk it'd be it would it would be more difficult for sure, sure. and sure. that's that's one of the that's one of the great benefits of the hum, the whole human experiment right but well, let's talk about these other organs please vestigial right vestigial organs this would be something that is a rudimentary structure in us uh, that corresponds to a functional structure in another animal, right? Uh, Mm. Sometimes described as the lower animals, which I think is hugely condescending and unfair. But we have all kinds of examples of this, right? What about things like tonsils or or like an appendix? Yeah, or wisdom teeth. Or uh, maybe a tail? Yes, people are born sometimes Mm -hmm. with a tail. Perhaps male nipples? Oh, man. Whoa. I'm so tired 
of, uh, I, I, like, it, it used to really bother me. It's like, why are these here? These have no purpose. You guys aren't using them, right? I mean, not, like, right now. No, I'm just saying you're not using them correctly. Oh, I see. We're a family <laughs> show. <laughs> Did oh, you guys see, I just, yeah. really fast. Okay. Did you see the article about the Atlanta native couple uh, Josh and Chuck posted this quick thing. Uh, a, a woman a, who left her job to find a male partner. Oh, to to breastfeed, breastfeed. At, at like adults, and this is apparently a huge thing. Is it like a like a fetishy thing? I or? think it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. but he doesn't have some sort of strange um, disorder mm-hmm. that makes him some sort of breast milk vampire. Does she like have to burp him and stuff? I don't know. I don't. But but I did some looking into this story, mm. and it appears that there's a whole counterculture of people who do this, who believe that there are massive health benefits for both parties. Yeah, there are people who say that there are health benefits. Yeah, and perhaps that is an episode for another day. And perhaps, perhaps you are right. And hey, uh, it's tough to be happy. So right? I wish them the best of luck. It sounds like it's consensual. Returning to organs. So we've got these things. We need many of them. There's some that we don't particularly need, need to live, right? Like uh, you can go without a kidney, you yeah, know, you not could, both. <laughs> you could go without wisdom teeth, right? Sure. Uh, so. What do you do when the important ones fail? The ones that are not like add-on packages to the car that is your body, but the stuff that's like the engine and the transmission. Well, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, when people's organs failed, they died. Yep. That was it. Sometimes quickly, sometimes in prolonged, excruciatingly painful ways. The human body... To uh, bring it to our current capitalist society, the human body was a product with planned obsolescence, no warranties, and no returns. No exchanges either. Well, and that's not to say that over the years throughout history, uh, medical science hasn't been attempting to replace these things in dying humans when their their heart is giving out or their liver is dying or something like that. We've attempted humans many times. To try and replace these things. <laughs> yeah, not you, Noel, and me, but uh, fellow members of our species have been experimenting with organ transplants uh, since at least the 17th century in animals and in humans. And along the way, there were many, many, many gruesome, horrific, and tragic failures. A lot of them we don't even know about because they were never written down. Right. But uh, we do have early examples. Yeah, like in 1668, um, a bone graft was attempted using a dog's skull and actually successfully attached this graft to a human's head. Yeah. Yeah, and we see the animal transplants, the, the, the practice of putting animal components into a human body were... Um, were not unheard of. Well, I mean, at the time, it probably just seemed like a logical jump to make, you know? Why mm-hmm. not? Let's just give it a shot. And that could have also been at the uh, what-if stage. Yeah, sure. Especially if you're getting desperate trying to save somebody. I mean, and if someone is on their last legs, you'd try anything. And in that desperation in 1905, uh, there were some doctors who took slices of a rabbit kidney they put it into a child, and it did seem to improve kidney function, at least for a little while. Unfortunately, the child did die shortly after that from a pul- uh, from pulmonary congestion. Right. And then in the same year, 1905, uh, doctors managed to transplant a cornea into the damaged eye of a laborer, restoring his sight. That's That, to me, is crazy to think about in 1905. Like any kind of eye surgery back then. That's like buying a lottery ticket every day for a week and winning. Yeah. Then in 1906, we have a French surgeon, Matteo Jubile, who uh, attempted to save two patients' lives. Uh, they were suffering from renal failure by transplanting goat kidney into one of the patients and a pig kidney into the other. And they died shortly thereafter. And I think what the big takeaway is from a lot of these early examples is that these 
organs are incredibly specific. They, mm-hmm. and this is, goes into the whole idea of being on a transplant list. They're like, yeah, you have to get just the right one. It has to match your blood type. It has to, there are a lot of factors involved that, you know, will make this work. Otherwise, your body will literally reject this organ. Right. Uh, in this, there were other attempts through the 30s and on and on up. And with each of these, uh, with each of these failures, there were hard lessons learned. And it looked like it may be, it might be something that was just going to be beyond the bounds of reliable medical technology and science. At least that is until the first successful organ transplant in December of 1954. Yeah, it was this guy named Ronald Herrick. Uh, he was the first one. He had a successful transplant procedure. Pretty awesome. Um, it was, it's a cool story too, actually. And, and there's a How Stuff Works article on organ donation where you can find this story. Um, he, he had a twin brother named Richard and one of his, you know, his kidneys were failing and his brother basically decided, well, what if I give one of my kidneys? And the doctor saw this was Really interesting because it hadn't been successful in the past, but because their genetics were so close, almost identical, uh, they thought perhaps it would work. So the doctors didn't have much, uh, faith that this would actually be carried out. Even though, you know, they have faith in themselves and being able to make the procedure happen, they don't think it will, the organ itself will take. The great thing is that it did work. Both of them survived, and they went on to live happily ever after. Right? Or did they? Yeah. I mean, that part, we're kidding on that part. No one does that. But they did okay. Yeah, they did great. They both recovered, at least. What a Debbie Downer you are, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm more, uh, what's a, what's a, da- a word for downer that starts with a B? So we could do it like a, Bingy bad attitude. That's pretty good. No, it's terrible. <laughs> well, that's why Debbie Downer exists for a reason. You you're know, right. You're right. Go-to. Go-to. You're right. You're absolutely right. And there's no reason to be down, is there? Because this worked very well. And after this watershed moment, more and more successful transplants took place. So today, at least in the U.S. and, and really globally, if you are someone with enough money and enough luck, enough opportunity, you really can get a second chance at life with a new organ. We cannot emphasize how amazing this is and how technology still, since I'm, I'm going to try to be positive for the rest of the <laughs> podcast. I appreciate now. that. I, I appreciate it too. No, uh, we still know that this medical technology continues to evolve at a breakneck pace, you know, doing amazing things. If a child, for a child born today, The day you're hearing this, by the time they are 18, it is quite possible that they will be able to buy uh, grown organs, grown in a lab, not taken from another person, or to uh, take possibly organs from genetically modified animals or entirely uh, entirely synthetic things. However, we're not there yet. At this point, your best, the the best and only way uh, that you can get another organ is by getting it from another person. Many people volunteer to donate their own organs, like the twin we mentioned earlier, uh, either a kidney or, you know, you can live with one kidney, like you said, Noel. You can chop a liver almost in half. And, and it'll, it'll regenerate. Yeah, and it'll regenerate to almost its full size. Or uh, if you are a person with a driver's license in the U.S., you are incentivized to be an organ donor because you get a little discount. Yep. And what they do is they just say, well, if the worst thing happens, the worst thing for you at least, then something great might happen for some other people. Which is a pretty terrifying thought, but at the same time, you know, if if you're dead, depending on your religious and spiritual beliefs, then... Hey, who cares? Somebody else can use it. You can't take him with you. You know, and arguably, you could say this is a form of extending someone's life. If you are, if a piece of you lives on in someone else. 
Absolutely. The pharaohs of Egypt would probably disagree, though. I mean, they had all of their organs pulled out and put into jars and preserved yeah. in their tombs, you know, so that they could have them in the afterlife. And that was part of the uh, that was part of the belief system at the time, you know. And there there's still some there's still some religions and belief systems that do not allow for organ donation, like the Roma don't practice it because they they believe you need your physical body and all its components for at least the first year. Yeah, because you have to retrace your steps, right? Mm -hmm. And now we know. Now, now we know that this this stuff does work. It gives the average person a chance to be a hero and to be quite candid. This is a situation where people need heroes. Between 1998 and 2008, there were more than 91,000 living donations. That's donations from somebody who, Just in gave theory, it. will survive yeah. after uh, in 2006, nearly 46% of organ donors were living donors, so that accounts for about 21.6% of all organs donated. So, like Matt's, Matt, you said, you can donate part of your liver and live. You mm-hmm. can donate part of a lung, part of your pancreas. You can donate a whole kidney. Yeah. Or you, part of your intestines. You do have to be in pretty darn good health to make a donation like this. Oh, I mean, it is true that there are only a few prohibitive factors that could stop you, uh, certain diseases, being HIV positive or mm-hmm. something like that. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, still, I don't think anyone would want uh, my liver, probably. Ben, do we have a stat about how often direct family members are the ones that are doing the donation? Because that would just, seems to me that would sure save a lot of uh, this this. Process, you know, right. all these lists and the waiting list. Search for compatibility. Well, we don't have that exactly, but we do know, according to the American Transplant Foundation, that of uh, about 5,000 living donations that occur that they watched, only one in four of the donors was not biologically related to the recipient, at least from their perspective. Interesting. It's not, uh, it's not legal to buy or sell organs here in the U.S. for transplant, but it is legal for, to buy and sell them for research purposes. So as long as you say, well, sorry, Uncle Sam, this is not for me. I am uh, doing a science project. And we've got a couple more stats, if you want. Uh, according to the Department of Health and Human Services, more than 2,000 new names are added to the national waiting list for organ transplants and they get that's every month and every day, like the day you are listening to this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, in the U.S. alone, uh, about 18 people die while waiting for an organ transplant. So these people, these voluntary donors, living or dead, are doing um, terrific, wonderful, and much needed work. And we need more. But here's the thing. Not all of these donors are volunteers. As it turns out, quite a few of them are victims. And we'll get more into that after we take a quick break. So as you can tell from the statistics we covered earlier, everything that we've talked about thus far, the need for organs far outweighs the the supply for organs. And what happens then? There is a basically a, a a gulf that needs to be filled. And as we know, when there's money to be made, people are going to come along and fill that gulf. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when when supply and demand don't meet, there's going to be profit, yeah. and uh, that's what we see. And the question becomes existential. You know what I mean? This mm-hmm. is this is not. Will I steal uh, a Celica or an Elantra? from someone because I want a Celica or an Elantra or God forbid a Honda Odyssey, which is not worth it. Uh, this is a question of survival. If you are sitting next to someone listening to this and you are close to that person, look at each other. What would you do to keep them alive? Would you donate your kidney? If given the opportunity, would you find them a heart? The average heart will beat uh, approximately 2.5 billion times in the course of an average person's life. 
So now you need to start thinking about the age of this heart you would procure. Because honestly, you'll get more mileage the younger that transplant uh, source is. Wow, Ben. Well, it's true. Unfortunately, it's true. And let's be honest. This is just my personal opinion here. Some of the results of this come about because the American medical system is a joke without a punchline. People are dying due to, um, due to a phenomenally Byzantine, uh, system of jacked up prices for operations and medicines that would be affordable in many other countries. This is again, this is just my opinion, but there, there are numerous facts that point to, um, that, that, that point to a very poor performance on the part of the U.S. medical cons- uh, system in comparison to the rest of the del- developed world. I mean, if we are considering the entire population, if we're only considering the people who can pay the price tag, then the U.S. medical system is the best in the world. I mean, look at the examples you see of people that, you know, are in the hospital for three or four days and then their insurance gets cut off or like, it, you know, it maxes out and they're left with like a $10,000 bill for being in the hospital for a few days just so they can breathe. Or a $50,000 bill. Of course. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then be in debt for the rest of their lives or bankrupt, right? Mm -hmm. So this, I mean, and that maybe is a sub, I know it's a touchy one for a lot of people. So that will perhaps be a subject of a future show. I don't know what you guys think. And of course, uh, we can anticipate the arguments. People say, well, medical care is not free. That is true. And that's something we can explore in a future episode right now. In the case of kidneys, which are by far one of the most common organs, transplanted, donated, harvested, trafficked, only 17% of the annual demand is being met. And due to, again, skyrocketing medical costs, the vast majority of U.S. citizens have virtually no way of affording a living donor. So make no mistake, legal organ transplants, like many other operations, are overwhelmingly out of the reach of a lot of people. Not to mention, maybe you're just so far down the list. Yeah. And it's just the time is of mm-hmm. this is not on your side. People will do desperate things in times of this kind of stress. Yeah, that's a really good point because even if we're talking about people who have enough capital or income to, uh, to have the best medical care in the world, right? And maybe survive as long as they can on the list, then there's some things, you know, you just can't legally buy. So imagine, imagine, Matt, that you are a multimillionaire, but, nope. but you can't, you can't afford this legal avenue. And that leaves you with two options. Yeah, I guess I would die or I would find a way to get one. Guess which one people tend to choose. I'm guessing they just take kidneys. According to the UN, there are three broad categories of organ trafficking. Number one are cases involving traffickers that force or actually deceive victims into giving up an organ. Example might be a person is kidnapped, their organ is harvested. Or, or the, this, this is the one that everyone knows from the movies, right? Yeah. You meet a, a charming stranger, a great cool, guy or girl or group of people and you party a little harder than you intended and the next thing you know yeah you wake up in a tub of ice in the hotel and there's some staples Mm. on your side that's That's chilling um we i talked to you guys about this before the show uh the movie sympathy for mr vengeance Mm -hmm. Uh, i think this is a it's a really really dark movie it's beautifully made though not for kids definitely not for kids but it involves this very thing um and it points to some of the uh conditions that might lead someone to enter into an even an agreement with uh these type of folks where one of the main characters has a sister who needs i believe it's a kidney and she's on this waiting list but it's not working out and it's taking too long and she's not doing well so the main character um finds these gangsters and agrees with them like okay i'm gonna you're gonna take out my kidney and we're gonna do the operation instead they knock him out take his kidney and his money and disappear right and this this is common enough to be a trope in a lot of fiction as far as how often it actually happens that way in real life it's it's tough to find 
proof. Uh, but that's not the only case. You said there are three categories. Right. So the second category uh, involves cases where victims formally or informally agree to sell an organ and then are cheated out of money. So the, the thing for yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. film is almost a combination of the two are then cheated out of the money or paid less than promised and threatened. Um, you know, totally. You'll take what we give you. Exactly. You're lucky to leave with your life. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. These are, um, opportunistic, manipulative folks that are, that are doing these things. They are finding people in their time of need, their time of most desperation yeah. and, you know, turning the screws on them. criminals. Yeah. 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 Well, and sometimes it even does happen voluntarily where someone will fly to Turkey or something to mm. give their, their kidney four or five thousand dollars, you know, four ten thousand dollars US. Meanwhile, the person who is taking the kidney is going to make ten times that, twenty times that. Yeah. And as, as, as problematic as Ben said, as, as our medical system is, at least you do have some assurances and you know everything's documented and you know nothing mm-hmm. like that would ever happen and hopefully uh your chances of survival are much higher because it's cleaner and there there are better standards for care but there's there's another thing we have to say here we i don't want to jump ahead too far other than to say there is a vast criminal element to this and this is something that happens whenever something is illegal that people are going to do, there will be, as you said, no opportunistic people involved. Uh, imagine having a gambling debt. You're in over your head. You have no hope of paying this off within the time allotted to you. And then, well, no, let's say I have a gambling debt to you. Let's say I, what's a massive amount of money to owe for gambling? One million dollars. Okay. So I had a wild night in Macau and now I owe you the uh the shadowy leader of the underworld one million dollars and you told me i have 48 hours it's hour 47 and i'm dragged you know in into whatever palatial place you have sure uh and and then you make it very clear that you're you're fine with killing me but be, but you give me a chance you t- you tell me i can give up you know my kidney or part of my lung or my liver. And of course people are going to say yes to something like that. It's horrific, but they will. And then there's the third case, which to me is one of the saddest. I have to say guys, in this example, it would be, it would make a lot more sense if it was maybe a hundred thousand dollars because they would make that. If you owed a million dollars. Yeah, they would just kill me and take and harvest. Cause me. they could, they could pretty much make that from your entire body. I would go to the chop shop. Ugh. Yikes. Don't do it, no. <laughs> Please right. don't do it, no. I mean, I've never started gambling. I've never gambled, and I, I don't intend to start now because I am frightened by this scenario. No, it's true. I mean, even, you know, I, I, I've i played some slots here and there, but uh, I <laughs> don't, don't think I could ever, you know, go beyond that. I thought you were about to say, no, it's true. I guess I would have to do that. <laughs> Well, you know, when faced with that situation, then I have to take care of my investment. Oh, oh yeah. Ice cold. I respect you, though. Uh, number three, this is perhaps one of the saddest. Yes, the third example is when a vulnerable person receives treatment for some ailment. Uh, perhaps it's real, perhaps it's not. Only to find when they come out of surgery or whatever procedure they went through, they find that one or more of their organs have been removed during the operation. And it ranges uh, from what organs are taken in this procedure. Um, and this is one of the more terrifying. I mean, it's, these are all terrifying. But this one, to me, trusting someone going into a surgery or something like mm-hmm. that, only to find that something completely different has happened, yikes. And we're talking about completely disenfranchised people that have no recourse. Migrant workers, homeless people, the impoverished, the illiterate. They are just easy targets for these folks who want to prey on the fact that they have no one to mm-hmm. protect them. And they can be any age. They can be any, you know, creed, race, ethnicity, whatever sort of label you want to attach to an example of the human species. Yeah, as long as they got the goods. And by that, I mean kidneys, livers, any of these organs that are, you know, ultimately pretty easy to remove in yeah. a pinch, which is horrifying in and of itself, especially when you consider that, you know, 
these are not done in sanitary conditions. These are not done in clean rooms, you know? Well, right. yeah, and the fact that they could be removed and then you can still live depending on how you were treated after and what type of process they took to actually remove it and then fix you up, which is, uh, that to me is awful. Can and you imagine living after that? Just happening to you, the PTSD that you would experience in your life? I personally would be thrilled to be alive. Sure. Because think of the time and money you save if you're working with volume on sutures, on cleaning up. You know? Yeah. Are you saying, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to just figure out why it's in their best interest to leave these people alive in the first place. I think that a lot of it is because it is a transaction, you know? So sure. if it's a transaction, then it's ultimately a business. And if the business model is, uh, it, you know, if you establish consistency, people will only come back to you or only go pay you if they know they're going to live. Yeah. So if word around the street <clears throat> turns out that you just kill people and take their organs, which we do have cases of that, then people aren't going to go to you with their gambling debts or their um, blood money of one sort or another. And, and OK, so we said earlier that kidneys make up 75 percent of this illegal organ trade. But do you know why? It's, it's not just because you can take one and sell it, although I think that's a huge part mm -hmm. of it. It's also because of the rising rates of diabetes, high blood pressure, heart problems, and such in uh, across the globe. Yeah. So you need those the filtration system that mm -hmm. are the kidneys, which are failing across the board. Mm -hmm. And for everyone who might think this is this is a strange thing for us to cover, uh, we would argue that this is an example of not one but multiple international conspiracies, not. Theories And again, a conspiracy just means people working together in secret toward a common goal. Organized crime necessitates conspiracies. This involves recruiters, people who transport the patient, underground medical staff, middlemen, contractors, buyers, and banks that store the organs. Because remember, organs don't keep. And a lot of people throughout the history of organ transplants have died because an organ was pulled from a cadaver that had been dead for hours, you know? So this stuff is on ice and, and on the good side, on the legal side, there's this amazing uh, logistics chain of how to, of how people move an organ and keep it stored on ice across the country or across the ocean to save someone's life. So and this yeah, can be a good thing. It can be a good thing for the, for the law side, the problem is because these networks are so large, when they get exposed, it will a lot of times be uh, one arm or one one section of a network. Mm -hmm. And you never really get to see the larger picture because, you know, when you're operating underground like this, you just pick up shop and get out of there if there isn't a good paper trail. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about some uh, facts about organ trafficking. So... Uh, I'll, I'll start with one organ trafficking accounts for five to 10% of all kidney transplants worldwide. That is mind blowing to me. Mm -hmm. That's like saying uh, illegal car sales account for 10% of all cars purchased in, you know, in the U S or something. You just wouldn't ever associate that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting. And according to the WHO, the world health organization, the illegal trade in kidneys has risen to a level that an estimated 10,000 black market operations involving purchased human organs now p take place every year. And according to a couple of organizations, Organ Failure Solutions, Organs Watch, and ESOT, the typical organ donor is a male about 28.9, let's say 29 years old, with an annual income of $480, while the typical recipient is a male of about 48.1 years old with an annual income of $53,000. So the discrepancy there between the donor and the recipient is pretty telling. And organs aren't 
just used for transplants. There's a demand for illicit experimentation from unethical scientists. Think of these as the modern version of resurrection men. Yeah, Resur- grave robbers. Re- resurrection men were grave robbers, uh, especially uh, in during a time when it was legal to experiment on cadavers for med schools and stuff, but it was illegal to procure the bodies. So that's a uh, uh, chilling, but not entirely inaccurate comparison. And then of course there are, um, there are other body parts such as bones or, uh, genitalia that are used for, uh, magical rituals. And the profit margins here can be outrageous. In July of 2009, Levy Itzhak Rosenbaum was arrested in Brooklyn for conspiring to arrange the sale of an Israeli citizen's kidney to an undercover FBI agent for $160,000. He said he'd been selling kidneys for 10 years underground. He paid 10000 for a kidney and sold it for 160000 And there are an unsettling number of examples of at least parts of networks that have been exposed. Al Jazeera really recently uh, put out a story, I think in February, about a a small syndicate in Indonesia in this place called Java, West Java, where this really small village that had a population of 30 people, uh, a large number of them sold their kidneys for around $5,000 each. Um and it was being run out of a state hospital. It, really crazy stuff like that. Just some bad people who are working with a couple other bad people inside a state-run organization. A story from The Guardian in 2009 discussed how some some pathologists in Israel were harvesting organs uh, from pa- Palestinians and several others. Uh, that was in the 1990s. It has ended, officially at least. Which is nice, and if you search for this kind of th- this stuff, just e- just put organ harvesting network mm. into you know Google, and then click on the news column, and just go back, and it, it's prevalent. There's a lot of it, and in neither of the cases that Matt just mentioned, neither in Indonesia nor in Israel, were these state sanctioned things. These were underground cabals operating, and then they were eventually exposed. Yeah, and that's almost always how it is. Except in the People's Republic of China. In the People's Republic of China, you can see uh, numerous accusations that say the, the government itself is harvesting organs from executed prisoners, or, as claimed in a PBS documentary, uh, from 2015 that the government is actually collecting organs from live prisoners or practitioners of a spiritual group, uh, of a spiritual belief system called Falun Gong. The idea here is that China is arbitrarily imprisoning this minority religious group and then torturing them, killing them, selling their organs, getting rich off what's called transplant tourism. Yep. And, and again, you can find it in the U.S. You can find it in Brazil and South Africa. It's this practice is occurring all over the globe. So you guys, why is this still going on? Why is this still so prevalent? Uh, I would say there's several reasons. Uh, one of the big ones would be uh, demand. And if we're saying demand, what we need to look at will be the precipitous rise of health conditions in the, you know, what, in the world entire, because there's this big stereotype of terribly unhealthy Americans, right? Uh, that stereotype has some truth in it. One in nine or 26 million Americans have kidney disease and most probably don't know it, but obesity and diabetes and related things are on the rise in the developing world as well. So, there are more people with worse parts. And I think as long as that situation continues until we can grow stuff in a vat, yep. until we can all live a, a more healthy lifestyle, and I am not volunteering, by the way, because I'm set in my ways and they are terrible, uh, until we can Iron Man or Cheney up some some suitable technological or mechanical replacement. Good old yeah. Cheney. The the prob <laughs> the problem with this stuff, Ben, is that it's still 
going to favor those that are wealthy because it will cost money. It's a service. Either, you know, it's not easy to remove an organ and put it back in. Well, and, sure. And as we start to develop, you know, more high tech ways of doing this, whether it's lab grown or, or what have you, it's going to be like these hypothetical situations with life extension technology. Who is that going to be for? Right. That mm-hmm. is going to be for the upper class, which is the class that is basically in control. Mm-hmm. That's a harrowing point because on the surface, the legal organ trade uh, at least if you, if you look at the rules or the guidelines for the list, uh, they say that this, the, a person's placement on the list is evaluated by factors that are entirely biologically related. Severity of illness, time spent waiting, blood type, match potential, and, uh, at least according to American Transplant Foundation, income, race, and social status are never taken into account in the allocation process. Which, Sounds like a beautiful thing. Until you take into account means to move yourself up on that list that aren't necessarily proven. Right. But, you know, colluding with someone who controls the list. Or staying or, or you know, the means to participate in this illegal market. Yeah. Which is making hundreds of million, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars minimum, probably more than an estimated billion uh, and, and also, also, it's tough to find these sorts of rings and, and wipe them out entirely. You know, people's survival instinct is, is good. The money, it, it's just so profitable, right? And these are people often operating across international boundaries. So at this point, at that, at this point, regardless of the, the various solutions to the various causes for this sort of situation, it just, it doesn't seem to be going away. This is really tough because in a lot of the black markets that we've looked at in the past, it seems as though the legalization of whatever product that is being sold can kind of solve that black market because it then becomes a free market thing. Okay. Right? But with this situation, you can't really legalize just the voluntary donation and receiving of organs from he- other humans. At least I, I can't foresee a way. Well, it just a lot is left up to chance when you mm-hmm. go the legal route. And it almost seems like the illegal route, you might be more likely to at least have the perception that you're going to get what you need. Mm-hmm. You know, with, without having to jump through as many hoops or wait as long and, you know, have less uncertainty. And you could even hypothetically hire an entire network so you could get the, the level of care that you would expect from a, uh, you know, from a, a top notch hospital if you just buy a doctor and her, his services for this one thing. If you just contract it out, it would cost an enormous amount of money. But if a new kidney gives you another nine years of life, a lot of people would see that as a as a fair trade, you know, and and I'm sure that a lot of the people who are participating in this illegal organ trafficking are also doing it without a desperation and are, are not monstrous people, you know. They they are possibly maybe it's more like a a matchmaking thing where they meet someone who wants money and they have the money and they say, okay, here let's make a deal. Maybe it is, it, it may well be consensual many times, but also many times it is not. Yeah, because we all, we've seen that this matches up with the act of human trafficking as well, right? I mean, where people will be treated like cattle and taken to another place where this will happen to them. Uh, it's been reported on a lot by the UN, uh, how closely linked human trafficking and organ trafficking is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's, it's weird how far ranging this, this process or how, how much it encompasses. It's also one of these kind of devil's bargain scenarios where you don't really know 
the cost, the actual cost of what you're buying. You know, yeah. you, you're paying money and maybe you, you can afford it and maybe you are a wealthy person that has decided to go this route because of the hoops required to get on a legal list to get, mm-hmm. you know, wh- what you need when you need it. So maybe you've decided to go this route because you feel like you can make it happen quicker for yourself or a loved one. Right. But you don't know who was manipulated, who was taken advantage of to get that for you. So you are becoming part of this problem by, you know, feeding it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely agree. This, okay, let's end on an up note if we can. I know this has been a, uh, you know, I took that Debbie Downer advice to heart. So I'm trying to uh, see some silver linings. There is a huge financial incentive now for uh, medical technologists and for inventors to create, and geneticists as well, mm-hmm. to create some sort of viable alternative. Because even if the illegal organ trafficking networks expand and expand even more so in size, we're at a point where taking things from one human and putting them in another is probably not enough. So what we're going to need to do as a species is to create a viable alternative, and people are working around the clock to do so. So this situation may become eventually a thing of the past. You know, eventually, hopefully, uh, your children and your grandchildren will hear about this age in medicine and treat it with the same incredulity that we used to treat uh Stories of a world before germ theory. They used to take organs out of one person and put it in another person? And they used to use hands to type? What? <laughs> Why don't you just think it into your uh, Google, I think? It is weird to think how long this conversation will last digitally if the Internet stays around for long enough. People, uh, people might actually listen to this and go, what? Oh, uh, that's too scary. Uh, but... Yeah, we hope that you, uh, we hope that you found this episode worthwhile. Do you have, uh, do you have any thoughts on organ transplants ethically, physically, biologically? Have you ever had an organ transplant? Mm, mm-hmm. or, or maybe donated one of your own? Mm-hmm. You, uh, you want to write to us and tell us about it? We would love to hear. Yep. Have you ever made it to the end of the Oregon Trail without dying of dysentery? I did once, but I, I, well, I did several times, but I played it on easy mode and I still lost some people. Mm. You monster. One guy broke a leg, uh, and then died of dysentery. Oh man, it was rough. Dysentery, <laughs> I think, is like the base level. And then there's other stuff. That there's like cholera. Sure. Okay, that's it. We really had to bring it back there, Noel? I think we should. I, I really enjoyed Just trying to lighten game. things up a little bit, guys. This got pretty, got pretty, pretty dark here. I, you know, I want to play it again and then name members of our party, like after, after you guys and some of our listeners, but I'm, nice. I'm afraid of, you know, what am I going to do if one of you guys doesn't make it over the river, you know? Well, speaking of parties, let's have a shout out corner party. Shout out corner. Our first shout out goes to Dakota who works at the Postal Service and listens to our show while delivering mail. That's kind of cool. Dakota let us know that Watch Mojo often uses our videos as uh, kind of source material for their own YouTube channel, which is kind of what we do with other YouTube channels as well. We'll use references. and But we did some checking, and they do uh, give us on-screen credit with text, so we're totally cool with that. And uh, last thing, he... Dakota wanted us to say hello to Long John. And I don't know who that is, but it's, it's Dakota's friend. The Watch Mojo, they also, I think they did a list a while back where they had different conspiracy type shows and we were, yeah, YouTube conspiracy on, theorists. On the list, so, yeah. Ben Bolin was and Matt and Matt Frederick. We were both on that list. We were, guys, we were all on the list. <laughs> And next we have Matt S. on Twitter. Matt, you said, have you considered doing an episode on the theory that we are living in a simulation? Uh, Matt, you also sent, or Matt S., you also sent a video of Elon Musk discussing this topic, which you, Matt F., I am sure, enjoyed immensely. I did, yeah. I, I think I shared it with you guys. Maybe I didn't. Maybe we just talked about it. 
It's the one where Elon Musk is asked a question about simulated universe theory, and he basically says we have a one in one billion chance of existing in base reality, which, if you dig into it a little bit, it's a little off. His numbers are a little off, but it's still fascinating to think that one of the richest humans on the planet believes that. Next one, we have one via Facebook from Corey C. Thanks for keeping me hip to all the neat, strange, and weird things you guys cover. And we have a little hashtag party here. Hashtag skadoosh. Hashtag all hail our ageless overlord Ben. Hashtag bag of badgers. Hashtag the only metal is cradle of filth. Hashtag give Matt his boat back. Hashtag tell Frank I said hi. Yeah. Is this someone that knows Frank? Yeah, you talked about Frank a couple times. Okay. And, um, I think you even mentioned you should say hi. If you ever see Frank, see Frank, say hi to him. He's a great guy. Yeah, I'm just wondering if this is someone that knows <laughs> Frank like in the real world. Frank does get around. Uh, maybe. I don't there know. There are many Franks. <laughs> yeah. The many faces of Frank. The many faces of Frank. And this, uh, thus ends our shout out corner for today. But never fear if you would like a shout out from us. Uh, we do, we do two or three each episode. Uh, if you have something you want to say to, uh, all the other listeners of the show, then hit us up on Twitter and Facebook where we are conspiracy stuff. And, if you don't- and that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff they don't want you to know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.